Hey. Uh, so welcome and good afternoon to all our enterprise friends here. I'm Laura Appenzeller, the Executive Director of the University of Illinois Research Park, and pleased to have one of our old friends and one of our entrepreneurs and residents, Dr. Gerald Wilson. Uh, he built his company here, Autonomic Materials Inc., from going from being a graduate student postdoc to then launching a business based out of uh, here, originally with technology from the Beckman Institute and expertise in material science. He is both a PhD and an MBA from the University of Illinois, and he has become CEO and helps to make other companies hopefully successful here as an entrepreneur and residence. So one of the most important things you can do as a startup is figure out how to get product market fit, but that takes work to have customer discovery and to start selling. If you don't sell your product, it's not worth very much. So you gotta have customers to be able to get market traction, and that's important for your investors, but it's also important for the long-term. Uh, longevity of the company is really predicated on the idea that you can make money if you need revenue. Uh, so Jeff's gonna tell us more about that today. And if you're interested in hearing more from Gerald's expertise as going from scientist to CEO and building and scaling a company and attracting funding, please sign up for time with Gerald. There's a lot of work, I'll say. I often refer grad students, if you're one of them here, from their own journey getting to uh, the point of launching a company, but he helps many others here. Too. So sign up online if you'd like EIR assistance. Without further ado, thanks, Gerald, for joining us today and sharing your wisdom. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. Um, it's always good to be back in the enterprise works. Um, as Laura mentioned, we were here for for a number of years and uh, a lot of familiar faces um, and, and, and uh, a lot of new people. Um, so today I'm going to talk about sales. Okay, and um, before before I get started, though, uh, I, I sort of just want to want to understand um, who we have in the room in terms of your, your, your respective backgrounds. Do we have anyone in the room who um, would consider themselves leading a sales function or um, is responsible for sales in their organization? Anybody? Okay, so can you tell me a little bit more? Yeah, so we, I found a JCI from the Okay. So we created our first round like a couple months ago. Like that's when we just started actually. Yeah. We're kind of go after like client pilots and made pilots preferably by the day. So I just kind of started as a single engineer and doing sort of sales stuff and kind of yeah. kind of Perfect. So you're you're gonna be responsible for sales and that's gonna be your focus. That is my job, yes. Perfect, perfect. Um have you had any sales experience, any sales training? Never. I, I was an undergrad. Previously, I stopped, but like, I most of my like, background is engineering stuff. Like, this is all great. Right. Hey, anybody with uh, with uh, a sales background, a sales experience? Okay. Can you tell yeah, me more from a system first to build a sales for the implementation? Okay. Say it's like I don't mind that. I said I've played a lot of CR and I don't think I'm going to be able to use the market. Okay. From sales operation, the two tools that I have like so Okay. I'm the company to do that. So, yeah. Yeah. That's perfect. I'm, I'm, you know, as we go, um, where, where it makes sense, it'd be good just to, to pull you guys into, into the conversation. Um, so, what about folks with technical backgrounds? Engineers, scientists? Um, is that pretty much everybody? <laughs> Anybody not an engineer or, or, or a scientist? Okay. All right. Okay. Um, so, I haven't given very many talks on, on sales, but when I have, uh, it's usually to a, to a group like this, um, where I, I'm trying to basically leverage the experience that I've had transitioning from a primarily technical role to building um, a, a sales system and a, and a sales plan and a sales strategy for organization and then ultimately managing the, uh, the, the sales organization. So oftentimes, as was the case today, there's uh, more technical people, more PhDs, and there are people with, with, with sales backgrounds. Now, what about um, folks who've gone through the i program? Okay, so we've got a handful. 
Um, so I thought that was, uh, that was going to be a, a good place to start, just in terms of um, sort of orienting us around what I want to focus on today. So those of you who've been through the i program are, are, are familiar with the, uh, the identification of product market fit and you know, what uh, Steve Black calls the four steps of epiphany, which is basically a system that is developed for identifying um, customers and building a, a, a system for engaging customers and then driving growth alongside your, uh, your product development plan. Now, when we look at those four steps to epiphany, starting with customer discovery, uh, and then moving to customer validation, and then ultimately customer creation is where you've identified a very clear value proposition, you have a good sense of what your ideal customer profile is, it's well defined, and you've sort of uh, cultivated a selling system. You sort of have an understanding that if we take these series of steps, there's a really good chance that uh, it's, it's going to lead to a sale. So that part of the four steps to epiphany is referred to as execution. And that's not what I'm going to focus on today. If you're already in execution phase, um, likely uh, the, the, the chances that you are still here, right, with us is, is probably slim. Um, but also, you probably have already cultivated a, a sales system. And so what I want to really focus on are for those of us who are still in the search mode, uh, where, e where either we've gone through customer discovery with uh, perhaps through the ICO program, um, and we, we have a, we, we've sort of identified product market fit on a conceptual level, right? But, there, but it's not yet backed up by, by sales. And so that just to sort of orient us to the, the perspective that I'm, that I'm bringing to this. Um, so you, you have conceptual product market fit and you, you've launched a viable product. And that's, that's essentially where, where we are as a company, as autonomous materials as well. Okay? So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on my background. Uh, I had included this slide mainly to help you sort of understand the context that I'm bringing to this. Um, as Laura mentioned, you know, my, my background is technical, and not only that, you know, I came up through our organization on the technical side of the organization, leading product development, and then uh, ultimately being uh, asked to run the company as CEO. But um, the, 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 the point of this is really to say that starting off, um, I knew nothing about sales, didn't really think much about sales. Sales was sort of an afterthought. It was something that you, you just winged, right? You know your product, um, you, you know your market, and you just go out there and you tell people about it. And, and the, the, the hope is that um, you know, you're going to convince and influence some people to, to buy your product. Um, but if I can um, leave you with anything today, uh, I hope it will be an understanding that um, when we talk about, about sales, right, for, for many of us uh, in this room, we have a lot of time invested in, in training around our areas of, of domain expertise, right? We spent years and years and years on engineering, natural, physical sciences, uh, for those of us with business degrees. Uh, you, you've gone to business school and you've learned about strategy and marketing and operations and, and finance and all that stuff. Um, but very few of us um, actually have spent very much time at all learning how to sell. And the reality is that is, that is the way you realize your value proposition in the marketplace. So one key takeaway today is that Think about all the time that you have invested in understanding um, or developing the skills that, that help you with technology and, and product development. And then think about the time that you have spent learning how to sell, right? There's a big gap there. And uh, um, if, you take, if you take away anything from this talk today, 
I hope it will be that that gap has to be filled intentionally. It's not going to happen um, just by happenstance. It has to be filled intentionally, and there needs to be a plan for getting there. Okay. So um, what I hope we can cover today is uh, to understand what a selling system is and, and why you need one. And given the format for today, there's a lot that goes into um, into designing a, a, an effective selling system, and there, there just wouldn't have been enough time to cover it all. So what I hope to do is to introduce you to elements of a selling system, and then take a deeper dive into a couple of tools that uh, weren't things that were intuitive for me, that I, that I, that I use in managing my sales organization now, and, um, and when, when doing uh, some, some selling myself. And then, uh, hopefully we have enough time to, sh to, uh, to then transition into show you, showing you how you know, we at Autonomic Materials have put all that together into, into, a sales, uh, into an effective sales pipeline. And again, uh, hopefully you walk away with a real clear understanding of the need to invest in building uh, selling capabilities. So, what does your selling system entail? Okay, so how many how many businesses do we have in here? If, if you that are represented here, so you you you, you okay? Um, so can somebody just give me a quick sense of how do you sell right now? Like just a quick one minute summary of your selling system. Anybody want to volunteer? Yeah. So Thank you. For, yeah. I appreciate that. systems that are, are built into our digital marketing. We have apps for sale on the app stores, mm -hmm. um, which is a whole other exploration of very many, not many people actually do the for sale app kind of issues. Um, but we use an experimental approach to digital marketing, uh, demographic and interest based. Um, and then we, uh, we kind of nail down who we're going for for the actual product. Um, and we have sales funnels that kind of go through and operate to conversions. Mm -hmm. And then those conversions lead to app downloads, and we try to track all of that through the process. Not every piece works correctly yet, but we have all the pieces that are, are automated to do that. Um, yeah, so that, that, that really sounds like you have kind of you, you, you automated lead generation, and you, you, you almost automated your selling system. We, we have to in a lot of ways because we don't the, the first per person charge in the LTV value yeah. per customer is usually a lot smaller. We're sure. not selling a ten thousand dollar product. Sure. Sure. You know. Understood. Yeah. So that makes sense, right? Tailoring tailoring the um, the, the, the selling system and selling approach to um, 
go to, to, the, to the opportunity side. Um, so I've heard uh, elements of, of what a, a, a typical selling system typically includes. Uh, my experience uh, when you know, we went out and, and started selling our products, uh, or when I've been on the receiving end, right? Uh, when I've been someone else's prospect, is that it, 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 it usually goes somewhat like this, okay? So I, 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 I'm calling this the traditional selling system. So you qualify for interest. So this is where, uh, so if we, if we sort of start from the point of you've got prospects, right? So we're not necessarily going through lead generation and all that. You've got prospects, um, you're engaging them, you know, for the, for the first time. You, you start by qualifying for interest. That's um, sometimes really understanding whether or not they would have a need for, for, for the product. Uh, you may be asking them some, some questions about, uh, you know, to try to understand their, their pain. Um, but it typically goes from qualifying for interest to then presenting a solution. Okay, so now we understand uh, where the pain point is. Uh, let's present something and try to uh, essentially show the customer how your solution um, uh, might actually address their, their pain points. And then you close. Um, and there you're typically overcoming uh, stalling, uh, objections, um, and then you chase, right? Um, oftentimes you, you're following up with a the customer, they may or may not be as responsive as you would like them to be. Um, you may end up in voicemail jail, um, you're leaving a lot of voicemails and, and, and not getting, getting a lot of... Uh, uh, a lot of responses back. Now, from, from, from what you've all shared, um, it sounds to me like some of you are still in, in customer discovery mode, but if you, if you already have a product, your product has been launched, and you're engaging customers and trying to sell, you, you probably have had some experiences uh, with, these, with these steps. Um, now, Think about when you've been on, on the receiving end of someone trying to make a sale, right? Um, when, I, when I think of having been in that situation, I can see the, the, the mirror side of, of, of this interaction where um, the salesperson is trying to qualify uh, my interest in something um, and <coughs> If they haven't done a really good job making doing prospect and making sure that I'm a good fit for for their product, what I'm doing there, we all do this. I'm withholding information, right? Uh, you walk into a store, and the sales clerk says, uh, "Can I help you find something?" What do you say? No thanks. I'm just looking, right? You're withholding information. Okay. This happens all the time, particularly if, if you get a, a, a cold call. Um, if it's something you might be interested in, but you're not 100% sure that the solution that's being presented to you is the one that you want to engage, then what you're doing is you're gathering information. They're presenting a solution, you're gathering information. And startups especially, uh, at least my experience in you know, talking to a lot of others, uh, tend to have a lot of challenge with this. Um, there's a curse of knowledge. Um, you know, a lot of people in this room are very smart. And as scientists and technologists, we're sort of trained to talk about how much we know. And so if you were in front of a very savvy buyer, that process can, can, can go on for, for a while. And they're just looking to get as much information as possible so that they can uh, make a more informed decision, which may or may not include purchasing anything from you. Um, while they're trying to close, they're trying to commit to nothing, right? Um, and then the reason you end up in voicemail jail is because they, they've disappeared, right? That's, 
that's oftentimes how, how it goes. And this, this happens because, um, you know, we, we, we rarely take the time to think about how can we actually try to control this selling process, right? If you're going to make a successful sale, um, you want to control the process, okay? So um, I'm gonna spend the rest of the time talking about selling systems. So what, what's a selling system? It's a process by which you, um, you take an opportunity to make a sale and develop it from beginning to end, okay? The example I already showed you is a, is a selling system. It just happens to be probably the most widely used. Uh, that's what is intuitive to, to most of us if we don't get the opportunity to get trained in, in, in sales, uh, but it's, it's not as, as effective. Um, I also think that it's, uh, you know, from some of the trainings that I, I've been a part of, I, I've come across this idea of building a, a, um, a selling system that is based on knowledge, skill, and discipline. Uh, so you need to have certain kinds of knowledge. You need to take that knowledge and turn it into a skill. We'll define these terms here in a sec. And then you have to have uh, the discipline to actually execute that skill when it's uh, when it's time to execute that skill. And if you develop a, a selling system for it to be considered effective, the idea of it would be that it consistently achieves a desired outcome. And it's efficient means that it's not wasteful, right? You can achieve those desired outcomes without wasting resources, time, money, or energy. Okay, so there, there are a couple of elements to exceptional sales performance, and I want to spend some time uh, talking about them. Um, so uh, this, this is an equation that, that I came across that I think really captures the, the elements of, of selling really well, which is that uh, it's, it's, it's your mindset plus the knowledge, skills, and disciplines associated with the selling process um, and then the multiplier on that are your habits, okay? And so that's, that, that's, that's where we'll end. Um, so we'll start by talking about mindset. And I think one of the things uh, in, in my experience that, um, that, that, that made it challenging for us are, are some of the myths out there about, about selling uh, that, that sort of affect our, our mindsets uh, around selling. And I've listed some of them here. So the first one is that Selling is making a sale at all costs, right? It's, uh, it's, it's, it's deal making, it's, um, it's manipulating a buyer. Um, and, and this sort of creates a feeling that selling is, net, is less than noble. And the reason to reject this is that it undermines business stature, right? So everyone in this room it, you know, is developing something that is going to solve a really critical problem out there. Um, so you're bringing a real valuable uh, service, a real valuable solution to, uh, to your customers. So the reality uh, is that this is selling is connecting buyers to a solution that they are seeking. Um, you're an advisor, you're an expert. Uh, and so when you are engaging with prospects, um, having that mindset that you're not begging for the sale, they're not, you're not there asking for them to do you a favor, you're there to solve a critical problem that they have. And, you know, if through your discovery process, you discover that they don't acknowledge it, that they actually have a problem, then you move on. But that, that's why you're there. Um, you, you have equal business stature uh, with your prospect, no matter, no matter who they are. The second myth is that the best salespeople are extroverted. Um, and this can tend to lead to a fixed mindset around, okay, I'm, I'm extroverted or introverted, and that might mean that I may or may not be as successful or my ability to learn certain things um, uh, may, may, may not be as good. And the reality is that this is actually not supported by research. Uh, I'm blown away by the number of times I've been in, in a room with, um, with really experienced salespeople who actually believe this, this myth as well, right? 
those who are more on the introverted side of the spectrum might, you know, sometimes actually do think that if they were a little bit more extroverted, they would, they would, they would perform better. Um, but the research suggests that ambiverts, those who are sort of in between uh, extroverted and introverted, get the best sales results, and you know, extroverts and introverts get uh, sort of equal results uh, on, on average. Um, and then the final thing is that everyone can sell. Um, I, I've heard this too. Uh, people say, well, you're married, right? You must have you know, convinced someone to do something. So you, you know, uh, yeah, you, everyone can sell, right? Or you have a job, right? You must have convinced somebody to hire you. Um, and the reality is that uh, getting someone to marry you is making one sale. Right? In a business, you want to do that repeatedly over and over again to, to generate revenue. Um, so the, the challenge with this myth is that it undermines the urgency around developing the necessary skills, right? Because if you think and you hear often that everyone can sell, then you may be disappointed with the results that you're getting and you don't really quite, quite understand why. Um, so not everyone can sell, but everyone can to sell. And so um, hopefully with the rest of, of, of the presentation today, I can, I can highlight a few things that you need to be able to key, key in on uh, as you begin to learn how to put together effective uh, selling systems. Okay, So um, we're going to transition now and talk about um, the, the knowledge, skills, and disciplines of putting together a selling system. So um, if you were sort of at the early stages of building a sales team, thinking about what are the things that we all need to know to effectively sell our product, right? We want to obviously understand uh, what the product does, the technology behind it, the kinds of problems it solves in the marketplace, but they're less obvious things that are important, particularly if you are uh, a startup, you know, the, the origin story of the company, for example, right? Um, when, you're, when you're at the stage that you're at, most likely uh, you're going to be selling to, to early adopters. And they generally come on board um, because they, they're they interested in what you're doing. You know, they, they may be as enthusiastic about solving similar problems. So things like the origin story, um, and you know other kinds of knowledge like that is important for putting together a selling system, and it's the kind of thing that you want everybody who's participating in the sales process for you to know, right? So, so, so that's that, that's what we're talking about there. And then skills are, are basically how you execute, and then um, we'll, we'll we'll define uh, these in more detail now. So. What do we mean by knowledge? So knowledge is, is what you can recall or remember, so you can explain, summarize, or compare. So for example, um, you know, if you're in with a prospect, we're talking about being able to uh, articulate the value of, of your solution relative to a competitor solution, for example. Okay? It's a sum of relevant facts, stories, frameworks, concepts, beliefs, opinions. Um, so this is, this, is, this is important as you build a, a selling system, everyone participating in your sales process will want to know a certain minimum set of uh, information about, about your company. Skill um, is an ability that's acquired through deliberate practice, sustained effort, and continuous feedback. Um, so the reason I'm defining it this way is part of, again, what you want to do uh, as part of managing your sales process or your selling system is, is to practice and to deliver feedback to the rest of your team. But the skills are typically about the timing, you know, when you do certain things in, in the sales process. That's where I think, you know, those of us who, you know, may be really heavy on the knowledge side, um, you know, sometimes miss it. It's kind of looking for uh, a good understanding of the right time uh, to, to, to do certain things uh, during, during the sales process. 
And then um, discipline is, is a decision and, and practice of taking action when you know you should take the action as part of the sales process. So where a skill is timing up of an action, discipline is whether you take action, okay? So as you're putting a, a selling system together or maybe adopting one and you're coaching your, your team around it, um, you know, focusing on the knowledge, skills, and, and disciplines will, will help in that process. Now, for, for many of us in this room, uh, I, I wanted to think about you know, how we generally stack up in these, in these areas. Um, so we, we, we typically, as founders, as technologists, have a lot of knowledge about, about, our, about our products, about our technology platform, about the marketplace, especially if you spend quite a bit of time doing, uh, doing uh, uh, customer discovery. So you, you know a lot about product and market fit. But skill during the sales process, as, as I just defined it, is not something we generally have a lot of, right? Um, and, and discipline, as far as selling is concerned, is not something we generally have a lot of because we don't really typically know uh, what that entails uh, within the context of, of, of selling, particularly a new product in a startup context. Now, um, where sales professionals are concerned, the, the good ones, anyway, will, will, will generally have a lot of skill. Right? And that comes from years and years of experience, knowing how to react to prospects um, you know, during, during the sale. And they'll typically have a lot of discipline because they're very motivated. It's, you know, uh, oftentimes the compensation uh, structure for, for salespeople, sales executives, requires them to be very disciplined. Right? So they're, they're going to take the actions that they know they need to take in order to advance the sales process. Um, so when you have this kind of um, distribution of skill sets, the question is, what do you do? So um, well, one thing that people always say is that as a, as a startup CEO, you're, you're always raising money and you're always Right. So my experience has taught me that keeping an eye out for somebody you can add to your team who uh, is very very knowledgeable on on sales is a good thing. It's, you know that really good salespeople, uh, particularly those that are, are likely to join a startup organization, help you build. Are, are difficult to find. So, so I would say keep, keep, keep an eye out and if you can add them to your team, do that. But then, you know, um, this really shouldn't be an or, it's, it's, it's an and, invest in developing selling capabilities. Just like you've invested in the capabilities that have allowed you to develop your product, you need to spend the time um, investing in, in, in selling capabilities. So, this is going to be a bit of a busy slide. I'm going to apologize up front. But what I wanted to do here was just get you thinking about what the elements of, of a selling system might look like. So these are, 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 are a series of, um, of, of, um, of, of elements that are similar to, to the way we approach our, our, our sales process. Um, and I wanted to just show you the scope of, of, of what could be included, and then we're, we're only going to spend time digging into, into a couple of them that I have personally found very helpful. So the first thing is prospecting. Um, you know, the example um, that, um, that, that we, we, we talked about earlier um, it included essentially prospecting. Right? So it's, it's identifying target market segments um, that you want to go after. Typically, by the time you come out of a, a customer discovery process, say with i for example, you know what segments you want to focus on. You may even know um, what kind of size of a customer, the average sale potentially, 
that could come from a customer like that. Um, so you know where you want to target uh, for, for, for customers. Um, but the rest of it that um, we early on really did not invest very much time in is developing tools. So this is the kind of thing that goes back to your, your knowledge database, developing tools for prospecting, including what, what people refer to as a sales trailer. Uh, that's essentially a, an elevator pitch. Uh, it, it's a core of what you offer that you can use to craft um, prospecting <coughs> scripts, you know, scripts that you and, and the people that you work with will use when calling a customer. Uh, and it's, it's typically going to be very well designed to help you accomplish uh, the next step, which is usually, you know, getting a, uh, get, getting a meeting. So the prospecting scripts, typically for emails and phone calls, are all, all part of the, the prospecting uh, elements of a, of a selling system. There's something I've come across uh, as I've um, been learning about sales called you know, the concept of upfront contracts. Um, you know, other people refer to this as a purpose benefit check. The, the, the reason um, people get, um, you know, when we're talking about the traditional sales system and the part where you are uh, um, withholding information is because everyone's busy and I just got this phone call and here's this person on the other end saying, Hello, Dr. Wilson, how are you today? And I'm in the middle of doing something and I say, fine. And, and they ask another question about um, that, you know, may not even be something that, 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 that was on my radar, right? You, you, you generally don't have time for that. So, but if you, if you put together what's called an upfront contract, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit more detail, um, then not only does the prospect know what's coming, uh, you can actually design it together so that their specific needs are met in whatever meeting you're having, and you can get buy-in from them. Okay? And then there's a the prospect pain. Uh, we talked about pain already. Uh, understanding the prospect's need, um, you know, and then probing, this is, this is where I think that, I think intuitively, particularly if you've gone through something like i we all understand that uh, we need to map the solutions that we have to a customer need. But how do you do that? How do you actually define pain? And then what do you do with that information is, is usually where, um, typically don't have a lot of information. And then you want to determine budget, you want to determine if the funds are available for your product or service, where those funds reside, and who's authorized to spend it. And what's the decision process? Um, you know, how is the decision going to be made, and, and who's going to influence it? And then, once you have all that information, you put it together uh, in solution development. And Increasingly, what we're finding to be very effective is engaging the prospect in solution development, make sure you're addressing the pain points within budget, and, uh, and this is where oftentimes the concept of team selling comes in. Um, not something we're going to have enough time to get into today, but um, being intentional about uh, bringing others into the sales process and making sure that when you're in front of a customer, that everyone has very well-defined roles. So a couple of things that I've seen. Um, a business development director uh, leads, leading the sales process for us, uh, sets up a meeting, they've been working with a customer for a while. Um, they are essentially the sales process leader, um, but he wants me to join the meeting for, for a number of reasons, right? Bringing in some, some technical expertise, Sometimes it's, it's, uh, um, it's bringing in some, some additional stature. The other, other, other uh, the prospect may have uh, some senior executives in the room and you know, he wants to make sure that you know, he's, he's not outmatched, there's equal firepower on the other side of the table, right? 
Um, but sometimes what happens in those situations is, you know, if you don't spend the time defining the roles in that process, um, you know, the sale is still owned by the business development leader, there's the process leader. Uh, you might have CEOs that walk into the room and want to take it over, right? And that's, that, that's a bad idea. Or you might have situations where the prospect then decides that they need to be engaged in review. And so having a plan, that's, that's something that, you know, we're, we're really focused on, having a plan on how you approach team selling is important. And then once you make the sale, it's not done. Um, having a process for onboarding, um, you know, customer success for us, we, we make cuttings that are applied in the field, so making sure that that whole product installation goes well, the customer has a good experience, uh, is, is an important part of the process, because it helps you get referrals, leads to opportunities for follow-on sales, and also build uh, a stronger relationship. And then, regardless of how the sale goes, a win-loss debrief is also an important thing to, to consider having as part of part of your process. And um, some of the best practices I've seen about that suggest that having someone else who wasn't involved in the process take charge of that win-loss debrief, understanding why did the customer end up buying from you, or, or why not, right, is can be helpful in adding to your your, your knowledge database and uh, refining your, your, your skills and, 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 and disciplines, okay? So what I'm gonna show, take a few minutes to show you now is just a, a few things. Uh, I'm gonna show you our opportunity profile, our ideal opportunity profile. So as, as, as small companies, as any size company really, uh, you don't have the luxury of selling to everyone, right? So um, what does your ideal opportunity look like? It's something that needs to be clearly defined uh, and everyone associated with your selling process needs to have bought into the fact that that is, that is your ideal opportunity profile. That is the way you're going to qualify opportunities uh, that you end up spending time on. Uh, we talked about the purpose benefit check. I'll show you some e examples of that, uh, or, or an example of how you put that together, and then uh, paying some considerations around uh, how to arrive at the actual pain and, and, and what to do, do with that information. Okay. Um, so if you do have a, a selling system and it's effective. The results of that selling system would, would be the following. You can make a sale, that's great, that's, that's ideally what you, what you want, um, or you could disqualify the, the prospect. This is just as important. Um, this is where I found our team spending a lot of time, um, particularly when you have a new product in the marketplace. You're eager, you're out there. Uh, you're going to hear a lot of no's, and finally someone says, okay, I'll meet with you. And you go in the room, you start asking them appropriate questions that help you qualify the opportunity, and then you realize really they're not your ideal opportunity. Uh, you know, they're not a fit. Um, it's, it can be very difficult to move on, but disqualifying the prospect at that point in time is important. You save time, you've learned something important about that. About, about your ideal customer. Uh, you could get a referral, if it doesn't work for them, maybe it works for someone else. Um, or you could get a well-understood future. So for example, um, you know, prospect might say, well, we just hired a new engineering manager, now is not a good time, we're gonna, we, we want them to get settled on what their priorities are gonna be, and then we wanna re Right? So you could have uh, a set of conditions that will necessitate re-engagement. So this is an example of how we put together ideal opportunity profile. The whole idea for this is to get on the same page about who to target. Right? Um, so some granularity is really important in this because when you start adding to your sales team or you, know, you may have uh, 
a founding team of a CEO and a CTO, and you're both out there starting to engage customers. You need to be on the same page about what the ideal opportunity looks like. So for us, for example, you know, we're looking for opportunities where the average sale is about 20K. Um, there, there are a number of different uh, applications where the sales cycle for our product could be really, really long. But we're really focused on those where the sales cycle is about three to six months. You know, the number of products or services that are included, you want to you want to define that, and then you want to have an approach for how you're going to actually prospect. How will you reach out to customers? Um, and for us, we're doing email marketing. We're sending we're setting up webinars and and then uh, doing call follow ups from there. Um, it will also include what what are the key industry issues? Okay, so like I said, we make coatings. Um, our product solve customer problems by mitigating corrosion um, while also uh, limiting the amount of VOCs, volatile organic compounds that their products release into the environment. That is a key regulatory trend, right? So the profile will include that. Um, and that the asset owners that we're looking for, that we that are the end users for our product, they need to be those that not only value high performance, but also are very clear that uh, operating in a way that lowers the CO2 impact is, is important to them, right? And then, so um, another example is ease of application. You know, when you're talking to um, a, a customer, if, if they're really keen on simplifying the way that, you know, our, our product is applied in the, in the field, um, you know, that's part of, want them to be located in the US, that's our focus. Uh, we want information about what their incumbent products are. Uh, for us, that's traditional solvent borne epoxies, the workhorse uh, coating system for corrosion protection. Um, and then who, who's the typical problem owner? Uh, and for us, that's typically an engineering manager or, or operations manager that's in charge of maintaining an asset. Okay, so putting something like this together working on it with your team and, and really using that during the qualification process will help. Uh, upfront contracts, um, it's a way for a salesperson and the prospect to agree before the meeting about what the meeting will entail, okay? Um, it sets appropriate expectations for both parties, it eliminates mystery, right? Um, and the, the elements, uh, of an upfront contract or, or or first benefit check that we we typically would have is you know what is the purpose of the meeting for us it's going to be to move the sales process forward <coughs> we want to also find out uh, what is on their agenda what what would they like to learn uh, when we when we get together and then you want to prepare them for what you want to learn from them uh, again. This is going both ways, equal business stature, right? For you to be able to help them, you need to be able to, to get some information from, from them. And then you want to schedule um, you know, a time, a place, uh, all that. And there has to be an outcome. The outcome is going to be a decision to proceed, in which case you're putting together another purpose benefit check for your next meeting, or they're disqualified. They're just not the right customer. There's no need to hang on in that relationship. Uh, you move on from there. Now let's talk about, about prospect pain. This is really about what, what, what's the need. Um, there, there are three levels of need. Um, you know, this comes from some, some sales training that, 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 that I've done. They're, they're usually the superficial indicators. So for us, it's, for example, um, you know, our asset has a lot of corrosion. It's uh, it's difficult to maintain. It's taking it's taking a while. Uh, we're doing multiple maintenance cycles uh, a year, for example. Um, but there's usually another level of that. There's an e economic impact level, which which really has to do with why are the surf why are the surface problems actually problems, right? They're, 
in our case, just to give you an example, that there are problems because um, it's, it's costly to shut down a water park, for example, for many months, right? So that's where it, it translates to um, uh, it, it translates to economic impact. And then below that, there's a personal impact level, which is, well, if we know that it costs us money to keep operating this way, why haven't we changed? Why, why aren't we using better products? Or why wouldn't we be open to using better products? And that usually lies uh, at, at, at the personal level, it's a personal impact level. Um, there may be a reason, you know, the typical one, uh, we've, we've always done it this way, right? Uh, not wanting to take the risk of trying something new. But what we found also that, particularly when you are a, a new organization, a startup, limited brand equity, for example, is, you know, there is a risk there. Um, you know, they're not familiar with you, they're not familiar with your product. Um, and so figuring out a way to, at a personal level, provide incentive for change, right? So push against that fear of change is important. So a lot of what we end up doing, for example, is designing small scope projects, pilots, things like that for them to get experience with the product, and that generally <laughs> tends to um, uh, that generally tends to lead to uh, a lowering of, of the fear of, of change. Okay. So if you're the, the prospect agree on the 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 need or the source of pain. Uh, if you agree on the economic value of the pain, if you're going through the process of asking them questions about their pain point, if you can actually quantify the pain, so for us, for example, it's, it's the labor associated with doing maintenance multiple times a year, it's the lost productivity of shutting down a facility. If you can put a number to that and put it in front of the prospect and get them to agree that yes, this is actually the economic value of, of the pain. Uh, and that that cost is only going to grow the longer you wait, if you can agree on that. Um, then you also want to know, can this prospect actually say yes or no? Um, but if you agree on the, 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 the first three things, then what, what are the reasons for, um, you know, what, what, what are the options for moving forward? That you may not agree. You know, uh, the prospect may not acknowledge that there's any pain. Again, you disqualify and you move on. Document what you've learned. Use that information to refine your ideal customer or ideal opportunity profile. But if pain is acknowledged, then the options are do something now. So now you're advancing in the sales process. You're moving into solution design, working with the prospect. You're talking budget. You're talking... Uh, who's, who else is going to influence the decision-making process? Do something later. Well, so then you want to review the cost of waiting again and, and understand uh, that they, they still do, in fact, want to wait and why. That's, that would be valuable information. And the why uh, for, for wanting to wait um, is typically... Well, I shouldn't say typically. Sometimes it has to do with perceived risks, like what we've already talked about. You know, small company, little brand recognition, no experience or confidence in your product, concerns about your company's viability. So when you're building a multi-year um, maintenance plan around a new company's products, there, there are those kinds of risks involved. Okay. I was going to ask you real quickly. Um, uh, what's, do you have a small story about the first sale that you've ever done personally? How bad? Yeah. Um, yeah, I, you know, in, in almost every instance, we're, we're still a pretty pretty small organization. So, and, and our product is, is still, it, 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 it's a technical solution, right? So, so I'm, I'm, I'm still very involved in, in, in pretty much every, Every sale that, that, that we make, um, including you know the way we're 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 actually organized is you know we we, we take advantage of, of distributors as well, um, and so sometimes they're actually at the 
at the front of okay, perfect. At, at the front of at the front end of, of making that sale. But let me just um, I, I think we're, we're we're transitioning to to the end here. Uh, I think the, the last point uh, I want to make is is habits. Um, this is one of my favorite quotes from James Clear. You, you, you do not rise to the level of your goals, you fall to the level of your systems. Very, very hard to implement, but definite, definitely worth it. But I just wanted to show you this. I, I know you, you, you can't, can't really see the numbers, but this, is, this literally comes out of a, a spreadsheet looking at our, at, our, at, our, at our cadence. And what this is, is we, we have our, our forecast for the year, and we literally take that and break that down based on what we know about uh, the probability of moving from one step to the next. And we break that all the way down to how many times we need to be talking to customers on a weekly basis to, uh, to meet our sales goals. Um, so this is where you know, the discipline comes in. Um, once you do this, then sticking to it and, and executing uh, along these lines is, is, is really important. And then I'll, I'll just end here. This, this kind of shows uh, how this all comes together uh, for, for, our, for our pipeline. Um, we are part of a number of sales organizations. Um, we use that in, we, we, we go to trade shows, we get those contacts, we put together webinars and launch and learns. So that kind of leads to how we generate leads. And where our ideal opportunities typically come from working with contractors, engineering firms, asset owners. Um, we go through a process of, of specification with them. Sometimes that typically, that, that might result in initial deployments and then ultimately a sale. And I've sort of outlined uh, along the way there how, uh, how we're leveraging our selling system to move through, uh, to, to build the pipeline and then ultimately move through it to, to generate uh, a sale. And in sales, people always talk about always, always be selling, right? Uh, ABS. Uh, my, my mantra really is ABQ, always be qualifying. Because the reality is spending time selling to the wrong customer is just a waste of time. So. Qualify hard in the beginning. Don't be afraid to, to really understand whether this customer is likely to buy from you or not. And as you move through the various stages of the selling process, think of each, each uh, stage that you've passed as some, right? Don't think of it as, oh, I've already spent all this time with this customer, I'm gonna hang in there. Uh, it's really all about the information you get at at, at each stage that you're at to determine whether uh, that you're going to qualify the prospects to move forward to the next stage or if you're going to disqualify them. And something really interesting happens when you approach selling this way because most people don't. Um, it's, it's like when, when our kids kids were young, I, I chased them around trying to get them to, you know, to take their baths in the evenings. And they didn't want to do it, right? And so when I'd say, okay, you know, don't take a bath. You can't take a bath. We're not going to, you know, that's a fun, but we're not going to let you have one. Then they want to take it, right? So, so something happens when you tell a prospect, you know what? Our best customers typically do X, Y, and Z. And, you know, from what you're telling me, um, these are not the steps that you're going to want to take. So... Uh, you know, we may want to move on until we can find, you know, something that we can work on together. Uh, you know, really interesting things happen when you're actually willing to exercise that equal business stature and qualify with that, with that kind of focus. All right, so this was a bit longer than I intended it to be, but I'll stop there. Happy to stick around if there, if there are any questions.